Hello, and welcome to Sunflower Sutras. I'm your host, Tara. To start things off, I would like to read Neutral Tones by Thomas Hardy. We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as though chidden of God, and a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago, and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die, and a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the God-cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. In our previous episode, I had mentioned a poem by Huascar Medina that I really liked from his collection. Uh, the poem was called uh, Don't Marry Giants, a romanticized alternative history take if um, Medina had an affair with Plath and was purposely caught. The larger subject matter of that poem is that there was a very troubled relationship between Sylvia Plath and her husband, Ted Hughes. That is what has led me to today's discussion. I would like to talk more about Plath, but first I would like to talk about other women in world literature history who, to be honest, either outshined their husbands who were writers or are quite frankly the only reason why we have the much beloved literature that we have from these men. To begin, I would like to talk a little bit about Sophie Bears. She was 18 years old when she met Leo Tolstoy, who at that time was 34, in 1862. They married later that same year. Sophia amazingly was able to balance raising the eight of their surviving 13 children with being the main copyist and chief editor of Tolstoy's books after their marriage. In fact, if it wasn't for her and her Goliath task of copying and editing the entire manuscript for War and Peace seven whole times by candlelight and with the aid of a magnifying glass to decipher her husband's little chicken scratch writing, we wouldn't have that book. On a slightly creepier note, Leo actually often used Sophia's diaries to get a glimpse into the female psychology to enhance the writing for his female characters in his novels, most famously implemented for his novel Anna Karina. Tolstoy wasn't the only philosophical Russian writer who used this questionable practice. Um, Dostoevsky actually had a similar method for writing his female characters using diary entries from his wife, Anna. But aside from boosting her husband's career, on top of being today known as a honorable diarist for her many, many volumes of diaries that she wrote through the entirety of her life, she has a very special place in the history of photography as well. She was actually one of the first uh, documentary photographers in Russia. She is most important historically, I think, for her own merit, for documenting in her free time the life of Russians during the decline of the pre-Soviet empire. This is before the turn of the century, and she was doing this. I think that's really cool, and she deserves to be known for more than just being Leo Tolstoy's wife. Next, I would like to discuss a woman who, thankfully stateside, has garnered much more attention in recent years. I would like to discuss Zelda Fitzgerald. She was a phenomenal spirit, and like I said, thankfully, 
it seems that she's finally garnering the respect that she deserved, and more people are recognizing her as the actual writer that Scott Fitzgerald wished he was. Scott basically plagiarized most everything that his wife wrote for herself or said in conversation with him or their many friends. In fact, while still under the effects of anesthesia, right after giving birth to their daughter, Frances Scotty Fitzgerald, Zelda said, Oh God, Goofo, I'm drunk. Mark Twain, isn't she smart? She has the hiccups. I hope it's beautiful and a fool. A beautiful little fool. And if you've read Great Gatsby, that might sound really familiar. Well, yes, he literally, without credit, took his drugged up wife's words and went on to write this American classic, and everyone gives all of the credit to him. Well, I'll tell you something else. That whole character of Daisy Buchanan is basically just his wife. But more importantly than that is the fact that even at the time, Zelda had open contempt for his plagiaristic ways. After the release of The Beautiful and the Damned, which was a book that I'll get to a little later about some of the drama behind it, because oh my, is there domestic drama behind that book. Zelda was asked her opinion on this book after its publishing. And there's this one line in particular, oh man. <laughs> it seems to me that on one page, I recognized a portion of an old diary entry of mine, which mysteriously disappeared shortly after my marriage, and also scraps of letters which, though considerably edited, sound to me vaguely familiar. In fact, Mr. Fitzgerald, I believe that is how he spells his name, seems to believe that plagiarism begins at home. Ouch! Sick burn, Zelda. It's well known by now that by the beginning of the 30s, Zelda was in and out of mental hospitals, often admitted by her husband. She was later given the diagnosis of schizophrenia, but to this day, that diagnosis is debatable, especially with the standards for female behavior at that time in American history. But it's also during this time that Zelda took it upon herself to be a writer and not just an editor. It was actually at her stay at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore that she had one of her most explosive bursts of creativity in the short matter of six weeks finishing an entire novel, which she sent to the main publisher that her husband used. When Scott got a hold of the book, he was absolutely furious. It was a semi-autobiographical novel that detailed a character in a very troubled, dramatic, exciting marriage. But it wasn't that she was divulging all of this personal information. The reason he was furious for her writing this book was that he was going to use the exact same source for the book that he was going to be writing next, Tender is the Night, and demanded that certain sections of her book be outright removed, edited in some manner, and just have totally different plots and subplots, so that he could be the only one to tap into their troubled marriage and use verbatim sections of their affairs and lavished party lifestyles for Tender is the Night which took two more years before he actually finished it. It was a similar situation for his novel, The Beautiful and the Damned, which he took a lot of, quote, inspiration from Zelda for. I think it can be very rightfully argued that without the existence of Zelda Fitzgerald, none of these books that we're being forced to read in our English classes would ever have existed. The book, by the way, that Zelda worked on was called Save Me the Waltz, and utterly tanked immediately after its publication. The book earned a grand total of $120.73, but I think the ultimate insult for Zelda at the time was that her own husband, Scott Fitzgerald, accused her of plagiarizing him 
and tender as the night. Zelda would go on to find passions in ballet dancing, painting, and once again return to novel writing shortly before her life was very untimely cut short. Her on-again, off-again stays at mental hospitals ultimately is what led to her demise. Now, it can't be said that it was a true case of neglect, necessarily. But in 1943, at the Highland Hospital, there was a small fire that started in the kitchen, and because of the locked door policy for the patients, ultimately spread to her room, and she lost her life in that horrible fire in that sanitarium. And America lost a fiery intellectual as well. Her life is very upsetting, just how much she was belittled because she was a woman. The next woman I would like to talk about, though, is on a slightly higher note before we go complete depression with talking about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. Vera Nabokov is a bit different than our previous two entries. She never considered herself much of a writer, but boy, was she a fascinating person. Uh, the wife of Vladimir Nabokov, who I think most people are probably familiar with, at the very least, his novel Lolita. When they married in 1925, Vera showed promise as a budding writer, but immediately placed her own career on hold to be the most angelic supporting person and artistic enabler, I think, in history for her husband. She acted as a critic, the first reader for all of his manuscripts, the main typist. In fact, the rumor goes that he would just dictate all of what was going on in his head and she would just act as a stenographer for her husband and complete the manuscripts for him, which, yes, does sound quite extreme. <laughs> Vera also, very eccentrically, was his main chauffeur, where he would lounge in the back seat of the car and, again, dictate story ideas to her while she would drive him everywhere. When he moved to America, he uh, started work as a professor, and she would attend every single one of his lectures, being in the front row. The rumor has it that she always had a handgun in her purse to protect her husband at all times. Upon reading more information about Vladimir and Vera, because this one, this last little detail was like, okay, I need to double check that one. There is some merit for concern, I would say, to the possibility of any given random assassination for her husband. His father was killed in a political assassination. He wasn't the target for that assassination. He was just an innocent bystander. But nonetheless, I kind of understand where Vera's coming from. The time period being Russians, father-in-law being shot. I guess I can respect this idea. Nonetheless, eccentric, yes. Loving, yes. Interesting anecdote, very. And now that I've taken us all on this very manic depressive roller coaster with this really nice little high moment, it's time to uh, bring us crashing back down as we now get to our main course, Sylvia Plath. Plath was actually a distinguished and somewhat established writer prior to meeting Hughes in 1956. They met at a party in Cambridge. Plath was smitten with Hughes from the get-go, having read some of his poetry in a journal that he was published in earlier that year. That was one of the first, if not the first, publication of his poetry. So Hughes was a greenhorn, whereas Plath was, at the very least stateside, getting a decent amount of notoriety. Plath especially had wanted to attend that party for the purposes of meeting Ted Hughes and fellow poet Lucas Myers after reading their poetry in that publication. Something about the way Hughes wrote really touched Plath, unfortunately. <laughs> 
and only a short few months after that party, they were married. In the beginning, their marriage seemed to be exactly everything both parties wanted. It flourished their creative efforts. They had this back and forth energy that fueled them as they would move in between the UK and the States for various job opportunities, but eventually settling back in Hughes's homeland of Britain. In little under a year, though, the honeymoon phase of their relationship began to flounder, and their short marriage showed for its tumultuous, ugly colors. In a letter that Plath had wrote to her then-therapist, she revealed that in between the pregnancies of her firstborn child, Frida, and her son, Nicholas, there was actually a second pregnancy that resulted in a miscarriage. This miscarriage itself resulted from Ted viciously beating Sylvia nearly to death. For many years, it was hypothesized that Hughes was an abusive husband, and it wasn't until these letters were uncovered only a short decade or so ago that the public got confirmation. Ted Hughes acted as the poet laureate for the United Kingdom from 1984 until his death in 1998. He would go on to publish numerous books of poetry and, ironically enough, children's books. Back to Sylvia. Back to their marriage. The beginning of the 60s saw the couple expand as a family, and aside from the matters of emotional and physical abuse, Sometime between 1961 and 1962, Ted Hughes began an affair with a woman named Asia Wevel. Asia was a woman who had already in her short life experienced horrors beyond imagine. She fled Nazi Germany as a Jewish woman, and shortly after fleeing married, and her and her husband sought to rent a flat from the Hugheses. When Ted met Asia, by all accounts, it seems that it was an instantaneous attraction between the two. In July, Sylvia discovered the affair between Asia and Ted. By September, she had separated from Ted and was now living in a separate home from Ted. October of that year, saw one of her famous manic bursts of creativity throughout her life. It is on this period between October of 1962 and January of 1963 that she would write the poems that would eventually become the collection Ariel. After this creative burst began to fizzle out, Sylvia sought out antidepressants from her psychiatrist. In a short matter of a few weeks, on February 11th, in 1963, Sylvia Plath stuffed wetted towels between the cracks of the doorways in her home while her children slept, turned on her gas oven, and stuck her head in, killing herself at the very young age of 30. Immediately after Sylvia's death, Ted and Asia developed a domestic partnership that by many standards was very uneven, if not cruel. Asia demanded of Ted a legitimate marriage for which he would routinely deny her, though insist that she rear his children and keep his house. Only six years after Sylvia had killed herself, Asia in the exact same manner as Sylvia, took her own life in 1969 on March 23rd, also taking the life of the four-year-old daughter that she had had with Ted. I know this is supposed to be a poetry podcast and not some kind of, like, conspiracy podcast show. I know there's probably a lot of those. But isn't that very oddly suspicious... I'm not insinuating Ted Hughes is a murderer. I mean, he could be. 
But can we all just agree that he was a really, really horrible person? <laughs> but keep in mind, Poet Laureate from 1984 until his death in 1998. Good job, UK. In a similar fashion to Scott Fitzgerald insinuating that Zelda had plagiarized his work, shortly before his death, Ted Hughes published a collection of poetry that immediately skyrocketed as a bestseller called The Birthday Letters. He didn't talk a lot about Sylvia and specifically about Sylvia's death in the decades following, but this was the first time he had a full collection dedicated to Sylvia and talking about how her death had affected him. It's important to note that immediately after her death, he had burned her journal, citing that he didn't want the children to ever read the contents inside for their own protection. The poetry in the collection, The Birthday Letters, it's very numb. It's very accusatory, and it's very much putting oneself on a pedestal in the eyes of tragedy, I feel. I think it's also very important to take a moment to read a passage from a poem that Sylvia had written. This poem was written in the midst of her marriage to Ted Hughes. She called it The Jailer. This section in particular I would like to share. All day, gluing my church of burnt matchsticks, I dream of someone else entirely. And he, for this subversion, hurts me, he with his armor of fakery. His high, cold masks of amnesia, how did I get here? Indeterminate criminal, I die with variety, hung, starved, burned, hooked, I imagine him, impotent as distant thunder, in whose shadow I have eaten my ghost ration. I wish him dead or away. That, it seems, is the impossibility. Earlier verses in the poem refer to acts of rape and further beatings from this husband. Obviously, it doesn't necessarily have to be herself that she's writing about, but again, oddly suspicious. And yet for many years, people have supported Ted Hughes, and people think Scott Fitzgerald is one of the best American writers, and people will refer to the partners of much-beloved writers simply as such-and-such's such wife, and not as an individual person. I hope that discussing these women can maybe help us think about how implicit some of our sexist attitudes are, and especially give respect to these amazing writers that these women were. And now for something completely different. Our listener submission. This submission is brought to us by Alex Strepik. Alex was born in 1968 close to Frankfurt as Alexander Dreppert. He studied psychology and linguistics and went to Boulder, Colorado for his PhD finished in 2001. A German author with hundreds of publications for both poetry and science in native German journals and anthologies, Alex was also the winner of the Wilhelm Busch Prize in 2004. He has numerous English poems published in such places as the Cincinnati Review, Notre Dame Review, Borderlands Texas Poetry Review, Parody on Impression, Orbis, The Interpreter's House, The Journal, and many, many more. In 2015, Alex took home the third place prize for the Gabo Literature Contest. His first one is called Bye. Bye Burgers. Bye Blamange. By bountifully, by beads, balsam, beatitudes, brilliancy, by baubles, by bloaters, by boaters, by beefsteaks, by barbells, beginners become brawny beefcakes, by backwoods, by badlands, by back big broad 
Blackjack by Big Buck Big Boogie's Bright Broad Being Brought Back by Beat Banker's Boundlessness Blank Bankruptcy Brings Bonus by Bogus Boys Backhandedly by Big Boobs Big Beauty Brings Big Benefit by Bargain Bin Barf Bags Boys Barf Bit by Bit. That piece was published in Parody on Impression in 2013. Underpass. Unbosomed unbelief, unheard until untold. Underworlds, underlings, unzip, unpack, unfold. Unnumbered undertones, unbared unconsciousness. Underachievers, unfertilized, unless under umbrellas. Uprising unknowingly, underpass. Underdogs unfold unguardedly. Untamed undertow, uncovered underground. Us, untangling uncharted ultrasound. Unheard underdogs, unwanted uprightness, unconfirmed uproar, uncashed utterly unless, under umbrellas, uprising unknowingly, underpass underdogs, unfold unguardedly. That poem was featured in Borderlands Texas Poetry Review in 2013. And lastly, Transoceanic Twitter. Talkative tubes, Twitter, trigger, transition, to timely, tighten, to mescent, transmission, tie Trotsky, to Trudy, Tunisia, to Tennessee, trigger, transparency, trashing, tranquility, take textual tadpoles to terrify, titillate. Troglodytes talk, take to tolerance, transmigrate, travelogues, tom-tom tons, terrible tastelessness, treasure troves, tongue-tongs, Trenchancy, tastiness, two trillion text tatters twittering tirelessly, trading triads, trueness, tapeworms, tomfoolery, tattle torpedoes turn tiny trivialities to trash tornadoes, tumultuous tautologies, take tessellations, take turns, take text tweezers, trigger talk, triple tripe trips, take tipsy text teasers, Tremulous Toastmaster, Titanic Travesty, Turning Tricks, Taking Turns Toughly, Tempestuously. And this poem was featured in the English Journal National Council of Teachers of English in 2014. Thank you very much for your poems, Alex. They were quite fun to read. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us by liking us on Facebook or donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash sunflowersutras. We'd like to give a special thanks to our patrons, Poet Jen Harris, E. Campson, and Heather Aranda for helping us keep this show running. If you or someone you know has some poetry that they would like to submit to the show, feel free to submit to us either via our Facebook, or you can submit the pieces directly to me at tara.bartley at yahoo.com. Salonga fall and farewell.